ಭಗವತ್ತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಮ ಸಂಬುದ ಸ ನಮೋ ಚಸ ಭಗವತ್ತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಮ ಸಂಬುದ ಸ ನಮೋ ಚಸ ಭಗವತ್ತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಮ ಸಂಬುದ ಸ ಹಾಮಿಜ್ ಟು ಹಿಮ್ ಓಲಿ ಒನ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟ್ ಒನ್ ಓಲಿ I don't know why I get mixed up. I have seen three, three translations of that last week and I was going over, how are they figuring out how to translate those? I thought it was pretty easy and people were play, doing it. Anyway, what we're going to do is we are going to keep going with the foundation series and part of that index, part of that index is to actually tear apart the dependent origination it's right in front of us now we talk about uh, and by the way i didn't set up this the index for this bonti set up the index and i remember just surrendering to what he wanted to cover in this and so he kept in about it and you know this so we're trying to follow what he did in getting to put this thing together So we're going to look, when we look at dependent origin, what I'd like to do is, since this is Wednesday, is give it a week's period of time, get as many people as possible into the room to do uh, a dependent origination workshop all the way through. And uh, the, it's like I said, it originally is an hour workshop. If I stick to the pages that we have, I give you the pages and we go over the four pages that we do this and how to, t how to show it to somebody. And you get the understanding from this, I think, that this, you're looking at a human being and you're examining human cognition. So this is something you can actually share with anybody from the Buddhist perspective. We were pushed very hard at first when we were doing this, why are we looking at it from this perspective? And it all comes back to, we're looking at it from this angle of um, what that process means for the individual in everyday life and how things are actually working. And we are looking at dependent origination. Uh, what I tell you in the workshop is there's a couple different ways. I'm not, I'm not going to go into it very much here. But we're choosing this way of looking at it so that you can apply it in a very simple um, application to your life, your whole life in everyday life. How does everything happen? So every time, it's not just about your meditation uh, experience with this. It's about applying it in life and using it as a tool to understand how do I get angry? How do I get sad? How do I have anxiety come up? How does it work? It isn't about why, because the moment you ask why, you have to dive into the past or you have to get preoccupied with the future and you don't know how they work. And so you are not accurate. You're not accurate at all. So rather than put your energy into worrying about what might happen or re-comparing it constantly to the past, Uh, the challenge is to see if you can evolve above that in the present time and use the line of cognition to understand how it's working and how I can change the outcome of interactions with people by understanding how everything operates, okay? Now, I'm going to do one question uh, before we start. Uh, because we had a question come uh, in and I wrote, uh, I think he's here, Ravi. Hi, Ravi. Okay. Ravi wrote a question and this is the kind of confusion we run into in, in Buddhist, uh, in the Buddha Dhamma. There's all these little groups, you see, and we think, no, we don't have clear way sometimes of seeing how these groups what they're for 
In this case, the question was, a question came about the lengths of dependent origination and the five aggregates. So we had to identify for a moment what exactly is an aggregate and what exactly are these lengths and the process of, of the dependent origination. This is outside the workshop, so I can explain this one to you. So when we say five aggregates, we are saying five components of one mass, one something. And the something is the human being in Buddha Dhamma. So what is the human being? We start out by saying the components that make up the human being are aggregates. We're using the word aggregates and there's five aggregates. So the five aggregates for the being are the body from head to toe, feeling, the three kinds of feeling, all right? Body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. Body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. So body, head to toe, feeling, three kinds of feeling, two or three, take your pick. Pleasant, painful, is fine to work with. Pleasant, painful, neutral is okay, too. Uh, and then perception, body, feeling, perception. Perception perceives, it names things. Without being able to name things as you go through your experience, you're at a loss. You're just in a room sitting here and you don't know there's a couch and chairs and a table and all these things have names. Perception perceives. When I see, um, you know, this uh, glass, what says glass in my system as a human being is perception, the power of the brain to perceive. So there's a section of your brain that perceives and names things, okay? The body feeling perception, thoughts, thoughts that are arising from the brain, the production of thoughts from the brain is all that this is, is talking about in, in the way of aggregates. And consciousness, cognizes and cognizing is understanding or comprehending what's happening so these are the elements now if we want to compare uh, this sort of thing to say what, how does that really work we can take a swiss watch okay and you take the watch and you ever see one of those watches in the mall go to the jewelry store and find one of those watches you can watch it for a little while a few minutes you see inside the watch where you, it's an open back on the watch and all the little cogs and wheels are inside of that we could say those are the aggregates of a watch and the watch the way it operates it operates similar inside um, those pieces make up the watch the watch can't operate without those pieces so what Siddhartha did, he was investigating about the dependent origination. He was investigating to find out how everything worked. And his, the way that he investigated always followed the Four Noble Truths. So what is the suffering? He was trying to figure out what was the suffering first. And he started to intellectually consider this and you know, reflect on it, contemplate it. And he came to the conclusion that death cannot happen, the aging and death without birth. And then he said, well, if the birth, how did that happen? And he contemplated that and he watched it in his meditation and his life and came to the conclusion that it happens uh, because there is a birth of, of the uh, birth uh, of the action. And then there ha this happens, it operates. Now, when he's first looking at it, he's looking at it just as a human being. Later, he's looking at it more deeply at a higher level, very, very high level of uh, observation that you're being taught. And he's looking at it, um, how everything works in a person's life and he's applying it to the world. But in the beginning, he's just looking at it as the 12 links, okay? And uh, in contemplation of this life and the next life and all the things that are involved in the religion that he was in before, and he's looking at it from how is all this work? 
and he finds the dependent chain. Dependent origination is not the same as the aggregates. The aggregates are just making the person. Now we're gonna, how does this person operate? Now we have a process of how the brain operates to perceive and understand and experience in this existence. So this process is called human cognition. Why is it called dependent origination? Um, Rebbe had, uh, had me really going. I mean, I, one question led me to another question, led me to another question. So why does it, um, it tap, tap you? You know, why do you wanna figure this out? Because you, you say the aggregates are the parts the human cognition cognizes, that's how the experience happens with consciousness cognizes, okay. And then now we have the process and these links are dependent. Now I didn't really have this in my workshop, but I needed to, this was good for me. These links, why are they called dependent links, dependent origination and or dependent co-arising? They arise one at a time. And after he figures it out intellectually, he eventually sees this in his own practice. He starts to watch how craving actually comes up and how the pressure builds and the, and the suffering actually happens. So it's from the contact. Well, the most important thing, I don't wanna get into this right now because I wanna get into the, into the uh, lesson tonight, but each link as it happens, what does it mean to be um, dependent or co-arising? It means when this link comes up, watch, when this link is here, when this link is up, this one can come up. When this one comes up, this one is irrelevant. There's no part of this link in this one. Now, this is what Karuna Dasa found. And he, Professor Karuna Dasa from Hong Kong University did a thesis, and he has a section about dependent origination in the book. And in that chapter, he's, he's pointing out something. This one has nothing to do with that one in there. It just needed this one in order for this one to arise. When this one has arisen, this one can come up and that one is gone. This one is there by itself. And then when that one comes up, it's the cause of this one being able to come up and this one arise. Do you see how this is happening? This is important. We don't wanna get all mixed up or start thinking and making this more complex as it is. So it was a dependent origination of each one. And some other professors thought in modern times, and that would be probably about a hundred years back, I think it started. And now it's pretty popular to say dependent co-arising instead of saying dependent origination, but it still means the same thing. This originates only if this one comes up first, this one can come up, but that one is not part of this one, okay? So that's how that is working. And what it's showing you is a process that's going very, very, very fast in your brain, terrifically fast, and there's no way to get much value out of that. And they had another way of looking at it when they were applying it all the time they were concerned about the next life, the last life, this life. So they had this across lifetimes. But the application, I think Siddhartha really started to use when we look at how he's explaining things and explaining how to let go of the suffering. He's always used, going to the links in several different suttas, and it might be five of them or seven of them or nine of them or 11. You don't always see 12. You don't always see seven or 12. And then he also has uh, the 12 and then he has 23. And 23 of them includes the development of the human being to get off the wheel as well as explaining the pieces of the wheel. So when we do this workshop, this is gonna be real interesting because we really try to stick to it. I'll practice it during the week, next week, and we will do it um, not this Saturday, but the following uh, Saturday, we will dedicate ourselves to a dependent origination workshop. That should give you some time to get some people to come in, to listen to it ahead of time, 
so that we can do this once and unravel some of the complications. Okay. So today, um, we are thank, thank you, Mataji. Thank yeah, you. You are very welcome, Ravi. I hope it sorted it out for you a little better. Okay. Now, we go into looking today at um, the board. Uh, the um, This is the document we have for today. And this is a continuation of talking about um, meditation and mindfulness. First of all, they are two interwoven pieces. This is important to understand. Meditation doesn't happen correctly, according to the Buddha's way of doing it, without mindfulness being used as an observation piece, okay? If we're using it as a concentration thing, that mindfulness is the concentration uh, on something, it doesn't work the way he his outcome was. So I'm only talking, I'm not saying anything's good or bad or anything, I'm just saying to that experience it the way that the outcome matches what's described in the text we figured out it, the mindfulness is an observation skill okay and the 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 meditation is where you're actually doing the observation and the mindfulness has this remembering quality remember we talked about it before and it helps you to remember to continue to do this observation all the time. And it helps you to remember what to do the same exact way every time some distraction comes. So let's go into the documents. You see how they're hooked together. So you can't have meditation without mindfulness. And really, mindfulness itself, day to day, is a meditation that you use all the time. So they're, they're interlocked. Um, we start with a question, these questions, what is most important to pay attention to in the meditation? Now, see, now we're getting into more of the meat of um, the meditation itself to look at some of the things that might be happening for you. So executing the relaxed stuff, it, every time that you let go of anything that has distracted your attention and smiling on your way back to the object of meditation, no matter how deep you are in your progress in meditation, that's the most important thing to pay attention to, that in the process of the meditation. The smiling we're talking about is when you're in deeper states of quiet mind. It's not just here. It's you make an effort to activate the muscles on the corner of the mouth. Um, as Dave has brought forth to the group and showed us the new research that we came up with, finally, you do not have to feel like smiling. This is not something that you have to, I don't feel like smiling, and we keep saying to you, is muscles affect the frontal lobes of your brain to relax and open so that you have more um, objective use of the brain in whatever you're doing, very precise work, and your attention becomes clearer and you get ideas in easier. It's great for innovation. Someone came once to a talk I gave and said they were there from a futuristic innovation company and wanted to know if this would help. And I said, you have to be the judge yourself. He did a, a retreat with me and he was very pleased with it. I don't know what they did with it. They probably took it and dissected it somewhere and did something like it. I'm hoping they were enough on target. They could get the results they wanted. But the, but the relaxed step is what lets the final amount of residual what's left after the release step when you have something that you have something very simple you know like this in your hand and the relaxed step ha has no instructions really because it's so simple here it is this is this is in my hand 
and I'm holding on to this distraction and I let go of it and that's it. I just opened my hand. That's how you let go of something. You just let go. So you're letting go of it. And then your hand is still stuck up here. So you want to relax again. So if you, the picture I have in my mind to explain the relaxed step is a person is sitting with their hands like this in front of them in a chair or on the floor. That's your zero level of, and the tension comes up from the hindrance or distraction. And so you are the one, this is interesting. And I want you to get used to me telling you this straight up. I'm not going to say mind wanders or the hindrance pulled me away. I'm not going to say it anymore because that's not what happens. That's not what happens. Mm -hmm. We are responsible for moving over to that hindrance and there's no way out of this. We let our mindfulness drop and slip down off of our object of meditation. If you are in the deeper states, I speak to you this way, it's dark in there. There's not much going on. It's very, very, very quiet like sitting and how long can you sit on the dock at nighttime and watch the top of the lake just the black surface of the lake and you're waiting for a tiny wiggle underneath the surface and your brain notices it and six hours immediately and you just keep watching keep in mind your interest in your interest is i'm exploring something no one has ever seen before you are like Admiral Byrd going to the South Pole to see it for the first time. When you sit in meditation and you start to go into your meditation and you get past into the fourth jhana in the mental states part, you are an explorer. You are an adventurer and an explorer. So your interest is in what could happen while you are in a state where there's nothing there, what could happen, see? And you're going to tell the world, yeah, see? So you are that person who is investigating that way. So you can't blame it on what is just coming up in the brain and flying around you. And you decide to move over to this. This doesn't come and grab you and pull you away. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And so we all slip and we, we keep saying when it pulls you away, it doesn't pull you away. Yeah. It doesn't come and grab you and pull you away. You're just sitting there. You. So what happens precisely has to do with the seven enlightenment the enlightenment factors or the, I don't think it's the faculties that much, but it's, um, I guess it is the faculties. In the beginning, you could say it is the faculties. The faculties are this, the faculties are femqua, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. So if we talk about that little group, in the beginning of your practice, you have to come in and say, I want to know what this is about and what if and what are people and I can use it. If you really want to do that. You my advice is to put your faith in the Buddha that he did find something and there are instructions and we're trying to give them to you very precisely from the text. So you will follow the ones, the parts of it that will help you to be able to see and investigate very easily. Trust us, we're asking you for that, okay? Don't bring in other ideas from all over the place because those ideas didn't work and, and putting them in a bowl, it doesn't pay off, you know? It just doesn't pay off and mixing them all together. So it was pretty easy because the, it was easy to understand, immediately effective. What was right effort was? What is right effort? Uh, seeing the unwholesome mind state, identifying the 
tension and tightness that's coming up. Releasing that, releasing it, just letting it go and relaxing, smiling and coming back and continuing with what I'm doing. Now, if anybody's here from the retreat, I wish you all were here because, you know, we had a lot of, well, when I do that, if I'm past the very beginning of my practice, do I go back to myself? But nobody asked the question. They just did it. And then they were doing it and took for days and I didn't know they were doing it. So when they're pulled away, they would go back to the beginning, start sending it to themselves for 10 minutes and then do this again and again. No, we have to be clearer. This is partially my fault, partially Bonte's fault. It happens in his retreats also. You see, and we don't catch it unless you're asking, should I do that? And no, don't do it, <laughs> okay? When you're, you're beginning, you're sending to yourself for 10 minutes to get your body and your mind to understand, I'm gonna do this with loving kindness. You're filling up your tank with loving kindness for yourself for 10 minutes and getting into the frame of mind. I'm going to take some of this and share it then you're going to send it to another person. And when you start sending it to the other person, you're, you're just wishing it to them. That's all. But you have it and the energy is coming off you. And when you wish it, mind's beginning to like this because this is the way it was in original times. You know, the natural state was children do this naturally when you teach them. It's really fun, you know. But adults have all this complicated stuff in their head. So you send it to yourself, you send it to the other person. And then from then on, you don't go back and send it to yourself each time. Okay? Just if you want to get a little more strength in the very beginning, maybe the first day, maybe the second. After that, there's two things you should not do. After two days in, the, in an online retreat, you should not be verbalizing the wish anymore. And we forget to tell you this, you know? Stop saying the wish and trying to make, anything that makes you feel like you're making it happen is wrong, is wrong. So just remind yourself, I'm saying, may you be happy, may you be peaceful too. And then after a couple days, Go into it and say it in your mind and just do it. And your mind is going to get this. Your mind understands. Because when you were little and you were learning everything, once you got something like going up the stairs, you know, as soon as you walked over to the stairs, mind was ready to help you go up the stairs. It was right there learning very fast the same way in the beginning as a child. And during your life, as you get excited about something, you learn to do something pretty soon, like learning to ride a horse. At first, they put you on the horse, you're all up tremors and you're learning and everything. Pretty soon, when you see the horse, you know you're just gonna get up on the horse, okay? And, or a bicycle, ride a bicycle. And your brain knows right away what to do to help you. It's right there because it's learned. And it's learning to wake up something that was there when you were a child, it were much more open to this than as an adult. So it's reclaiming something that was feeling fresh and feeling light and feeling wonderment. And now you're saying it's okay to do this again. So your mind imprints and it's ready to help you do it. So the first day to yourself and then to the other person for a couple days after that, don't say the verbalization anymore. And try to remember, if you share this with anybody, that this doesn't have to be a great big feeling of loving kindness. It's just a warm, happy memory that makes you smile. And that you want the other person to have a warm, happy memory feeling too. It's not a huge thing. And try to remember that what we told you, uh, I think we did a fair job in this retreat to let you know, it's going to move across your chest and go up in your head. And one of the things that happens with this is it gets softer. Does that mean that you should be fretting for days? I need more power. I don't feel it's so strong anymore. But you're forgetting that when it, when it wants to get lighter, it might be that it's just changing into karuna. And karuna has a different 
different aspects to it. It's soft, it's gentle, it's quieter, and it goes up in your head. And you'll start sending, if it doesn't um, move up at first, you might feel, feel the feeling move and it's still meta for a little bit. So you're sending meta to the other people. And when you're sending it to the other people, most of the time it's going to change into the Karuna because it's going to, it, it knows what you're doing. It knows. And then um, what happens after that is when you do it to the directions, what happens if the feeling goes down a little bit with the people or a little bit with the directions? You don't worry about it. You don't have to go back to the beginning. You just bring up your energy more directly putting out the, what the Karuna, the, the compassion or the Metta and keep going with it. And you have to check and see if you're smiling. Your smile goes down, the power goes down. It's like part of the battery. <laughs> you smile and the, the, it comes up bright. When you smile, I can see it in your eyes. You see? When, if you, when you stop smiling, the energy goes down, see? So you bring up the energy, that's it, okay? So coming here, it's telling you that the relaxed step is so important because when you let go of this, you, your arm is still up here, you still have to relax, is a leftover. But does that mean that you're supposed to, did I say that you're supposed to stop and take 10 minutes and do a relaxation exercise? And you tell me, gosh, these six hours are taking a long time to do. And relaxation, exercise to start my hat. Listen, I, I relaxed everything before I decided to smile and come back. Or the guy will say, somebody will say, I relaxed everything in my body. I made sure I was relaxed. And then I went back and then I smiled. No, that's not the right order. Relax, smile, come back. I wish I could get you to all say that. Relax, smile, come back. Yeah. And how do you do it? You recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. You recognize, re <laughs> release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. That's how we were doing the R's. And if you wanna change it, you can just say, I recognize, I let go, relax, smile, come back. That's what you're doing. But it's not parking half an hour for each one of them. It's essentially, Bonte is telling you, I heard him tell on his talk the other day, three seconds max to recognize it, release, relax, smile, and come back. Three seconds max. And your mind's going to go like that. It's going to start doing it. But if you hem and haw and make it more than it is, part of this is personality and wanting to desperately say, I did this, I made this happen, each part of it, I succeeded. Let it go, <laughs> let it go. See what happens if you let it go. If you don't believe in letting it go, just I'm saying there used to be a commercial on TV years ago. So try it, you'll like it. <laughs> so try it, you'll like it. Just let it go, relax, smile, come back, see? And I wrote a little tiny book that I'm hoping Deepa will help me to get this finished. I'm going to talk to her tomorrow about it. This book has been floating around for two years. And it's a little book that basically says, never mind, never mind. Relax, smile, come back. See, just never mind. Because if we go through the text hunting for what you're supposed to do with a hindrance, we can't find it. You're supposed to just never mind and keep going where you are and trust that your mind is picking it up now if you really do have a block that's where we take you off the meta and you can't get any meta any feeling coming up there's a block something's blocking that's where we take you off track and put you into um, a cradle and have you do the forgiveness for a little while and clean out the closet from whatever is stuck in your head. Old grudges, dislikes, old divorce, mother-in-laws, siblings, I don't care what it is. Let it all go and see what it's like if you say, never mind.
See? Okay. Your attitude, attitude must be correct when you begin your meditation. For instance, what is your mindset as you go into your meditation? That's an interesting question. What is your attitude about the purpose of your object of meditation? These are the things we look at. Do you understand why you are doing the meditation in respect to your everyday life? These are good questions. And what is your attitude about this new relaxed stuff that used to be left out of the instructions? You know what happened? Somewhere, we don't know where, some really important monk Somebody had something to do with translation. Uh, and they decided uh, that that step in the Anapanasati instruction, you will become trans tranquilized. Well, there's a little problem. If you keep doing the anapana practice, the breathing meditation, problem with this, and it has to do with is this about is an adjective or it is an adverb in the instructions as an individual. on the in-breath bodily formation. The next line says on the in-breath, tranquilize the mental formation completely and on the out-breath, tranquilize the mental formation. It, were these steps, um, in meditation, that it is like the anchor point for the boat to be in the harbor, you put the anchor down and it won't float away because, because that anchor is holding you. But, you don't sit there on the boat and study the anchor, see? Um, it's your home base so that you can continue observing the impersonal nature of how the phenomena arise, exist, and pass away, because that's what you're trying to do. The object helps you to stay on track so that you can begin to observe how everything works around as it, things are coming up, being there, and falling away. The description is in the Anupada Sutta. We should be careful never to concentrate hard on any object of meditation to make something happen because nothing will happen except the nimitta will come up, you know, the light thing, but that light is a sign. And it's not a good thing to be concentrating, teaching your brain to concentrate on a sign if you're trying to reach a signless state that is nibbana, is it? Doesn't make any sense. Once you understand how the brain is working, you really know it doesn't make any sense. Twim offers a solution. Oh, okay. Uh, so many meditators suffer headaches, exhaustion, vertigo, and tinnitus. It's amazing. But Twim offers them a solution for allowing them to let go of the cause of this, the tension inside the mind from a concentration thing. Okay, so we ask you to add in a tiny relaxed step after you let go. This is why. And don't try to see what is left. Don't spend time doing that. It's not important. Just teach your brain to do both steps, the release and relax, okay? Which temporarily cleans away all craving and tension. It all drops away suddenly. And then you smile to uplift mind and sharpen your awareness as you come back to your recentering point and you continue on. You don't go back to the beginning of your meditation and then do something and come up to where you are again. You just go back to where you are. That's why it's only taking two or three seconds. Next main point is why, what should always be left alone? Leave, what, is there something in the meditation that you should be leaving alone completely? Yeah, all hindrances, okay. Anything occurring in any sense door, from any sense door, that we would call a barrier, a blockage, distraction, disturbance, hindrance, imperfection, 
obstacle, obstruction, a taint, or a fetter, any arising formation other than the object of meditation, which causes tension in the mind and causes our persistence of investigation to slip and our mindfulness to move away towards it and our curiosity to go in another direction from our objective of just exploring anything. You don't pay attention to it. The hindrance is actually empty of any knowledge or wisdom and should be immediately abandoned, relinquished, released, let go of, allowed to just to Anicca. Arising thought formations that cause us to move mind's attention away from the object of meditation should be seen as distractions to the practice. They're unwholesome because these formations are usually thought of as yours personally. Yeah, you think when it comes up, it's mine, I should look at it, you see? And that is the thoughts arising are me, are mine, are even believing that the thought is myself is a complete mistake. And when the distraction is paid attention to, this causes more distractions because TWIM helps us to practice recognizing these unwholesome states by detecting a change in tension as they are arising and observe how to let them, let go of them, relax, smile, and come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. This means an arising thought, feeling, color, a formation of any kind, sounds, all of these should be released the moment they are detected without thinking, analyzing, or further investigation. I used to say this stuff like a litany for in, in the beginning to convince myself to try to leave them alone. Just let them alone without mind's attention on them. Allow them to pass away as they will in their own time. After releasing and relaxing any hold on these distractions, you must put something in their place or they will arise again. And this is because the universe will not tolerate a vacuum. You let go of something. You have to come back and put your your um, your object back in place of it immediately. That's why none of this dilly-dallying with this over here, because if you dilly-dally with it, analyze it, look at it, investigate it, think of other things it's like, all those things are going to come up and bother you. Why? Because you told it there was a barbecue. You're lots of information. I'm going to feed you, feed you, feed you. And then it said to the neighbors, well, come on down. You can have some too. As soon as you think of other things, you come on, bother. This guy's going to pay attention to us. Wow. This is good stuff. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> After releasing mind's attention on any unwholesome interruption, the meditator smoothly relaxes all tension and tightness caused by the distraction. And then within that flowing motion, the meditator re-smiles to lighten up mind and sharpen awareness as they return to the object of meditation to continue on with this observation training. So it's telling you in these sentences kind of good because it's telling you exactly what's happening with each step you're relaxing the tension and tightness. And then when you re-smile, you're lightening up the mind and sharpening awareness. When you return to the object, you do it so you can continue your observation, your exploration. And so the meditator repeats this cycle. Anytime mind's attention, see, this is the mistake, is pulled away. Anytime you move away from your object. This is what, it's not edited yet the right way. This is your practice cycle. I don't ever want you to see from me, I want to go through my stuff and get rid of mind's attention is pulled away. No, it's not. Nothing comes up and gets a lasso out and starts making a rope and sends it over there and pulls me away. <laughs> Nothing does that. 
I stop paying attention to my mechanism of observation. That's what happens. So here it is. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, and repeat. Hey, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, and repeat. Hey, brain, recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, and repeat. Come on, brain, get it. And as soon as it gets it, it will do it. Automatically one day, it will surprise you. Somebody will come after you and you'll just be standing there and start smiling and say, well, I was just going out for ice cream. Now that you're done, would you like some too? <laughs> and they won't bother you anymore. Next question, what is the most important point in this practice cycle? <clears throat> what, are you, what are you really trying to do with these questions above here? Learning to see this point exactly proves to the meditator that a place with no tension can exist. What it's talking about is when you recognize something and you release and relax right there, the relax point and the smile, right in between, right here. There is absolutely no tension and tightness. There is no me, there is no I don't like it. There is no craving at all. What is that? That is Neroda. And it's there so small, as small as this little tiny, can you see this little tiny thing? This little hole right here in my fingers, like the top of a straight pin. It's very small. But if you're very quiet and you're very calm and you're sensitive to what's in your feeling of your body, and you know Goenka students are really good at this, if they're really watching, you can see that cessation point. And it's exciting. This point is an unusual state of mind. It has no craving in it, no clinging, no concepts or opinions at all. This is no tension no tightness, no stress, no movement. This is usually a new experience for people. It is experiencing what we call pure mind, or you can say still point. When you notice this spot, actually you are witnessing a tiny Nibbana-like state. This is not the larger super mundane Nibbana, it is a very brief glimpse of the lesser short-lived version called a mundane Nibbana. This state can last for a split second, a few moments or longer before it's fading away, but then it passes away. Depends how quiet you are, depends how non-investigative you are, depends on if, how much you are there. If you're just not there and you're just watching, it, it will pass, it'll always pass away, but you can see it. And just as you understand the word Nibbana, let's take a look at how this word is put together. Ni in the Pali language means no or lack of, and bana means heat or fire. And it is craving that is the cause of this heat or fire. Nibbana is the absence of craving or fire. Nothing is happening in this still point. This tiny spot allows you to witness cessation of craving, and that's pure mind. The next question is, when we practice, what are we attempting to discover? Well, you are attempting to discover to see the true nature of how everything works in our experience through this existence. And it will surprise you as you acquire this direct knowledge because you're practicing a system of knowledge and vision. Seeing things is how your knowledge grows. The meditator is trying to develop a non-judgmental observation power so that they can uh, clearly see how suffering operates. And by stepping back from our preconceived ideas and opinions, gradually we are able to witness a remarkably impersonal way in which our consciousness can cognize or understand the individual parts of events that are happening 
along our life continuum line. Remember I said birth and death and this line is your life continuum line. We begin to notice a unique interrelationship between the steps of the Four Noble Truths and our own investigation into how human cognition works. The human cognition we study today is called dependent origination or dependent co-arising by the Buddha. This impersonal process can be learned with direct knowledge observed in any event in life that happens. At first, when you begin to watch this, it is not clear and it's rather difficult to see. You must first learn what you are looking for before you can start to see it. You gradually learn it is very real and your entire experience in this existence is affected by this impersonal process. When you begin to understand it and see it, you're glimpsing into what some would call an ultimate reality. And when trying to see it within any situation, you will learn to let go of unessential ideas, assumptions, and opinions. That's how you get to see how things are happening. Because before you came to learn this, whenever thing happened, you always related it to yourself and what happened in my past, it must be something like that. And you stop doing that. This new knowledge is supported by our own experiential path as we keep investigating what the Buddha taught. The Buddha, he was a remarkable teacher. He told us the only thing to believe is what you learn through knowledge and vision, which literally means knowing by seeing. Knowing by seeing is the same thing as direct knowledge. This is the, the cold, clear, way he's talking you know just really clear now when you're looking at dependent origination i'm not sure it's in here i'm going to throw this in you know when a movie is and most of you are old enough to have seen a, a piece of film you know a piece of film and i don't have mine anymore but on a um an imax theater a piece of film is as big as this camera is this camera right here this is one frame is this big of an IMAX movie film, okay? And it, the, the film, I got to go inside where the IMAX film runs for the movie in California, in San Diego. And it, on these big, huge reels, just huge, each film that you watch for an hour is three miles long. And the frames running by is what makes the movie move, of course, just the same as the basic cameras. When we're teaching you about dependent origination, we are teaching you about the frames of a movie. If I took this part of the film and I, I was to hang it up like the old way, we would look at a section and decide if we wanted to cut that out of the movie and we wanted to hook it back together again and change our behavior by doing that. So think about if we cut out the frame for reacting back at a person who screams at you and the part that says the birth of reaction, we, we cancel that, we cut that frame out, we throw it away. And then we look again and we see, well, next time we look, yeah, but, but the, the, uh, Bawa is still here, the, uh, the, the section with the library of my personal reactions, it's still here. I'm not going to react anymore the way I always do. Let's cut that one out. So we cut this one out, we throw that one away. This is how a person heals with this. I figured this out over the years because my students told me first I stopped reacting, then I realized I was just doing things I always do and I, I threw out the library of my reactions. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to try to live in whatever I'm coming to as a fresh event without just reacting. Then he's, the person saw they were clinging. They were getting involved in this story about 
uh, why they didn't like something and their opinion was better than your opinion. And that was the clinging. And there's another one. We're going to throw that one out. You see? So now you're caught with craving. But when you get to that one, if you're smart, you identify the, the it happens, but you identify the uh, tension, the tightness, and you laugh and you, you stop. Now you're really changing and you're going to change your reaction totally from a reaction to a response. When you start responding everything in life relationships, it changes and this is what's happening. So in order to see how daily life events trick us into states of frustration and emotional outbursts, we only need to carefully be watching how seven of the 12 links in the process operate. The seven links we're concerned with are contact, and with contact as conditioned, feeling arises, feeling as conditioned, craving arises. Craving is I don't like it. And then with clinging, the story about why you don't like it based on why you didn't like it before and all those other times, and those stories just run, run, run in your mind. And then the habitual tendency to react that you always reacted, that one, you're, once you're clinging, that's the, the uh, condition. And then the, the tendency comes up, pushes up. This is the one. Take this card. This is the one. And then you give the birth of the reaction. And then at the end of the event, every event has a birth. And then it has an aging. And if it was um, a bad experience, there is variations of amount of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And the depth of that event, you see, the depth of it. So what we are actually teaching you is how one arising phenomenological event, phenomena is the phenomena that arises and logical, we're taking one, one phenomenal event, one at a time, how they happen at a time. And much suffering is caused by our ignorance of this knowledge about the line of human cognition that we were never taught how things actually work. Nobody told us because you know what? Nobody knew. And the Buddha gave his monks this kind of meditation. It offers a remarkable access to the fact that no individual has anything happening to them. What is true is that when present time events occur, you always have a choice of what to do. And this is your untold power, mostly unused in the human species today. No one is the cause of your pain. No one is running this process. No one is making you suffer. Any formations arising are supported only by the energy from past actions. That's the Kamapala that's coming through, the fruit of old actions. And the event impersonally arises in the present time, it exists, and then it passes away. Start by looking at the operation of your own human body if you want to understand. When our eyes are open, the eye sees forms. And when the ears meet sound, the ear hears sound. When the nose hits an odor, the nose smells that odor. And when the tongue meets a flavor, the tongue tastes. And when the body feels the tangible, the body senses touch. As a being, these five external sense doors operate in this way. There's no personal control of their operation. I do not make them operate. They operate when they are in good working order. And you would be surprised. You think it's silly. No one would ever come to me and say, no, but it's my site. <laughs> and I say, okay, okay, I'm not going to argue with you. You have to say it's my, no, it's not your site, but you have to figure this out for yourself. Tomorrow, here's my phone number, I'll give you my phone number. And tomorrow when you wake up, if you, when, if you can call me and tell me that you told your eye what to see when you open it, I'm waiting. No one's ever called me. <laughs> 
you open your eye, you see, then you, you compute everything, see? Internally, mind is a doorway as well to arising thoughts. Mind operates in the same impersonal way. You can prove this to yourself while driving home. You do not stop driving and decide to make a thought arise in your mind about remembering to buy the milk, do you? The thought just comes up. It impersonally arises and pops up in your mind. And this is the first part of what meditation is about, deeper understanding about how everything works. There is more. Gradually, we take all of the sense doors and go step by step into how each one operates. And by experientially learning about these doors, testing them out, we see we are not responsible for their operation the meditator begins to realize this is true. You know, this is an impersonal process that is going on here. The 10th question is, what are we trying to develop? We're trying to train, retrain our mind into more wholesome habitual tendencies by shifting our perspective, taking le things less personally, okay? The meditator is attempting to retrain mind to give up very personal, old, unwholesome, habitual tendencies that cause a rising tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. These tensions come from the grasping tendencies involved with greed and hatred and delusion. And these things are called the three poisons that lead to suffering. Delusion, what is that? Delusion is where we mistake everything to be very personal. And therefore, we believe that our entire experience is all about us. And this is why it feels like everything is happening to us instead of happening from us. This feels very heavy sometimes. It is why we begin to feel helpless. But when we have this kind of knowledge, one of the things that students have told me, I, I have this knowledge now I can sit down, I can look at what's, what is really happening. Is it really me? Is it mine? Is it myself? Is it this? And then how is this happening? Is it happening to me? Or do I actually have any control? And you, you have control, but a special way, I'll tell you in a minute about that. Indeed, this perspective, the medicine, this of uh, instead of this perspective, the meditator attempts to impersonally train mind into a new, more open and wholesome tendency of releasing and relaxing all tension and tightness by realizing and using the impersonal perspective towards everything. So when, you, when you're going, you practice the impersonal perspective. It isn't something that just happens. You start saying, is this me? Is it mine? Is it myself? Or is this just what this is? You have to teach your mind again, like you would teach a young child. You can say, you know, here's this, this is my toy. But is it my toy? Or is it a toy? It's different. You start teaching yourself now a different way of looking at the world so that you don't take on the heaviness of all of this. Um, this moves us naturally into the direction of developing generosity, good moral living, uh, loving kindness, compassion, uh, empathetic joy, and eventually firm equanimity, very strong equanimity. And during this development, the meditator is discovering a more peaceful coexistence with everyone and everything around them. Daily interactions begin to change by uncovering a new space in your mind for alternative solutions to happen. Um, a lot of times when we get involved in things, we get so involved in them that we don't see there is an alternative way of handling this. That's why I try to give you the lesson about the Four Noble Truths about using it and saying, you know, what if we look at this at this meeting this way? 
what each one of us thinks the problem is and what each one thinks the cause of it is and what each one thinks a good solution would be. And then the person takes that information and builds a solution for the group where everyone can see their part in the solution that the person suggests. That is the master leader. That is the, the master um, monarch. The one that governs the people, but has the people see they're being listened to and the governing is just making the whole thing work, but everyone's suggestion is in what you're trying to do. That one is the master monarch, the world monarch. And the Buddha was like that, he was like that. People begin to respond to each other instead of reacting. And this is the most important part. That's what it's about. Now, this assignment may have been tagged on to the other paper before, but what we had originally said um, was that while you're learning the meditation, you commit to sitting for a half an hour and each, each time that you sit minimum, no less, and you read over the training information at the website and try to follow the instructions very exactly. And you know, when you send me your reports, I try to underline where you went off track and then I'll pull it out of a paragraph sometimes and explain to you, do you see this? You didn't follow the six steps. You changed the order of it and so it isn't working. And if you're not smiling, if you move the smile somewhere else and you're not using it the right way, well, that's why you can't stay with the object of meditation for any more than a minute. Or you're just working too hard on concentrating on something. So you can't stay with the person for any more than one minute. How can that be happening if you're sitting for an hour or 90 minutes? And back up and look at it. And it always comes back to the instructions. 99.9% .9 of the time. The exercise is to treat yourself by taking a little walk outside to more closely notice your sense doors and how they're operating because the more aware, uh, becoming more aware of how you see, hear, smell, taste, and touch and how thoughts just come up on their own is, is really important for you. While doing this, you don't get serious. Just make this a game. You can do it with kids too, they love to do this. Keep your mind light and enjoy a fun observation time. Smile as much as you can through everything that you're doing during your daily life. Lightening up is extremely important with the meditation working. And I know that this may be difficult for you if you're practiced uh, any other way before, but please try to do this so that you can experience how different it feels when the tension begins to arise in a space where there was very little before. And the more you smile, the more you laugh, the lighter you feel. And that's how you feel the difference and you feel stuff coming up. So this is the end of this um, section. I'm gonna come back over to, um, to you guys. I think I am. Okay. And, um, hmm. Can you hear me? Okay, this is good, okay. So I wanna know how um, you have any questions on this because this is pretty, going into the pieces and I did, the one thing I didn't go into was the sitting position. I didn't go much into the sitting position, uh, but all, uh, I'm not sure, I, I know there's another section on it because there's another breakdown later on that goes deeper even into these pieces and explains some of the science behind it. Sitting positions simply do not have to be on the floor. And um, this is something that some people really are in denial about, but it's very important because when, you know, when you're in a retreat and you can take a person from a sitting for 20 minutes and they just can't sit any longer. You put them in a chair and bingo, just like that, there's two hours sitting. Something's going on, okay. And so when you look at what is most important about sitting to meditate is you do not move at all. 
when I was at home in Damasuka, there somebody came and made a bench and it was the same height when he left, he left it there for me. And I love that bench. Oh, I love it. The bench, you know, when you have an armchair, like I'm in now, your arms hit when you sit in an armchair. You actually need, what kind of chair do you need? Let's look at the, the drawing board for just a second. Um, what you really need for the, um, whoops, I don't know what I did now. Ooh, I'm gonna get on this one here this guy to go. What you need when you are sitting, um, you need to have um, a chair that is like this. When, when you are when you are sitting okay your chair needs to be on the floor and the height of the chair is what is so important okay the height of the chair should come up to behind your knee and when you sit on the chair, the person who sits on the chair, their legs should be able to come out and go into a 90 degree angle. And when you're at a retreat physically with me, I go around and I try to, to show you exactly how this is. Because the person, you want, no arms on the chair and it can have a cushion on it it's fine a pad or something you don't have to sit on just a bed i had a rug on my uh, my stool my bench and a small uh rubber piece underneath like a piece of a um it was a piece of a yoga pad and then i had a small mat on there but the thing is, when you sit, you want your leg to come out like this. And you want your leg to go down like this and your foot to come like this and come up. Like this, you have to do another color here. So, um, I don't know what happened. Let's see. Um, okay. You want you want to have the leg come up like this, and you want the leg to go over and back like this. You want it to come out like this and have a right angle where it comes down. This is very important. Okay, and I'll tell you why. As adults, we have a problem with our, uh, our back mostly at the base of the spine or in the mid part of our back if we slouch and our necks, our heads dropping, okay. But what happens is if you were to um, raise the, uh, to, if you were to raise this like this, because you were taller and you sat on one that was too, um, you sat on one that was too high, then here in the bottom of the person, their hips are affected. Their hips are affected. And it hurts the hip to um it hurts whoops wait a minute it hurts the hips this is the torso of the person okay 
you are going to affect the hips if this leg is high, okay? And then if the, if the chair is too high and your legs are not naturally touching the floor and the leg was down instead, you can pull out the bottom of your back and remember that when you are, when you are quiet, the quieter you are in your meditation, the more relaxed your body becomes, um, that you, um, you don't realize this is happening and all of a sudden you have a pain and the pain in the back is going to come, um, the pain is going to come like um, here at the base of your spine or it's going to come, sometimes uh, it runs up and it'll, it'll affect the neck here. Okay, it'll, it'll affect the neck where the head is, the head of the body, the head, the head of the body. Okay, there we go. Right, the head of the body. It's going to affect the neck, okay? So the chair is not a simple thing. When you're on the floor, if you have trouble with your back and you really want to stay on the floor, let's say you want to stay on the floor. Okay, I'm going to come out of here. Okay. Okay. If you're sitting on the floor, you have ways that you can fix this because sometimes when you're on the floor, the most important thing is to have this triangle, have the, the triangle set up with your body in the back, uh, in the back in the front, front, I'm sorry, the front would be, <laughs> the front would be, it would be, <laughs> there you go, like that. The front would be like this, and the back is where the top of the, this is up here, right up here, okay, in the back, okay? So you're trying to set up a balance. Now, if you find your balance, there is no work to keep your balance. And before I had car accidents traveling all over the world, I <laughs> was able to find my balance in this wonderful triangular sitting they talk about in yoga when you sit on the floor and they talk about it. They should be talking about it in meditation to find this three point balance point, okay? And you won't have to worry about anything. You do not have to change anything. It's going to be just fine. And you'll feel, you know, it's a very tiny little adjustment here, there, here, there, just a tiny bit like that. Teeny weeny bit. And you're perfect, okay? But not everybody can find this, you know? And the way to make yourself, you want to make yourself very solid in the position, but not with effort, just being in a solid position. So you can sit on a higher pillow with your feet in front that go down and that will secure you, okay? That will secure you. So that, and it's actually coming out the other way. You're, you know, your, your pillow is high and then your butt is here and it, you're cross-legged here coming out. So your knees are here, but they're down a little bit. You can try that. But don't struggle as if you have to stay on the floor. If you are starting to work in these suttas, they're sitting in cliffs, they're sitting in caves, you know? <laughs> they're, um, and when they sit in a cave, they sit on a rock, trust me, they don't sit on the floor. If there's a rock they can sit on, they sit up on a rock, okay? They'll sit on a, uh, you know, a, a, a tree that has fallen down. And when we were in the forest, we would sit anywhere that was, absolutely not really not it was quiet and secure area but as away from the serious crawlies <laughs> you know so there's all different ways that you can sit the biggest one is can you just sit still and not move that's the key so sitting on a chair there's nothing wrong with that and you know we know this is nothing wrong because we see how much progress somebody can make from sitting at 20 minutes and then putting them in a chair and boom, they sit for two hours. And the next day they're sitting for three. And the next day they're sitting. So 
is this not an issue? So why is the time so important? The calmer you get in your observation, the longer period you have for just being there to observe what comes up totally impersonally, the more your brain believes everything is totally and completely impersonal. And that's what's going on. Very nice, okay? Does anybody have any questions? I hope you have questions tonight about almost anything. Huh? Deepa? Mm -hmm. um, what, what about intuition? Where does that arise from? What is what? Intuition. Intuition. Intuition? Yes. Intuition, I'm sorry. Intuition, yes. Intuition, right. You know, some people have intuition naturally, and intuition is some, it just arises to tell you It'll give you an answer if you say, what is wrong? Why can't you say like, why can't I sit beyond an hour? Now, we, one person, I don't see her here right now. One person really wanted to sit longer. And I was caught with my legs up. I couldn't do anything. Um, I, and so I wasn't writing a lot back and forth to you all. I didn't even ask her if she was sitting on the floor or sitting in a chair. My first advice would be to sit in a chair. But when you sit and you go into the meditation, in the other lesson just on the sitting and going into the meditation, the whole point is the mindset of the person when they go into the meditation should be, I am going to sit in meditation just to see what happens next. You see that? I'm, it's, it's a two-year-old's heaven sent directive. <laughs> That's what they do. They walk around and they go, ooh, you know, and they, they peek, they peek at you, you know, they, they just peek from behind something and they come like, ooh, what's there? <laughs> they peek. And they want to know what's in the next room. Oh my gosh, I loved them when they were in there too, just, you know, following them around. What are they going to discover next? And um, they're just there to find out what's happening next. They have no predisposition about what should be happening. And the downfall for people in retreat is to have a pre-designed idea what should be happening, you see? Um, the necessity to smile, really a big smile, is totally not there. It's not necessary. The, the whole principle behind the smile boils down to these two muscles. And in the research that, that uh, David just shared with us last week, I was really happy to see that. Bonte was too. He made some remarks about it in his talk. Uh, because um, to finally see somebody who's coming out of a research block and saying it has nothing to do with wanting to smile. The benefits of the smile comes from just the activation here of the muscle. And they were, I don't, still don't understand where they were putting the pencil. Do any of you understand that? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I guess I understand it. Wait a minute. I had a pencil here. All right. It's like, I like got <laughs> walking around with your pencil like this. <laughs> I think that's what they were doing. And then measuring what's happening in the brain if you're walking around with a pencil like this. Yeah, But to do this pencil, I don't have to be ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ha, like this. I can just be like that. So what is it? What is it that's activated are these two muscles? And it's great because your face won't sag when you're older. You'll just look happy. <laughs> so your face doesn't sag because you're still doing something with your, with maybe you're not singing in choir every week now, or you're not doing something you used to do um, with uh, talking or I don't know so much, but we have this sagging thing that happens because we let go of these muscles. And there are a lot of muscles in your face. 
you know, and when I was singing, I was all going, yeah, 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 going around doing exercises all different ways to, to be able to, um, uh, we were practicing to be able to open our mouth the largest we could for sound to come out or the least bit of air control and things like this and to strengthen the diaphragm putting two big dictionaries on your stomach and and then uh bouncing them on the floor and then after you were through working with the dictionaries he would put you in front of the wall and he would say stick your diaphragm out and bounce against the wall to see if you could and then Oh, 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 can you hold a voice while you're doing that? You know, really funny stuff. <laughs> Just, he was, he has a real sense of humor. My teacher was in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and he had a real sense of humor <laughs> with the stuff that he used to get us to do. And he would just laugh and sit there and say, no, that's fine. Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> you know, and all you're doing is muscle, muscular stuff. And he'd have us to smile and ha, ya, 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 to make sure our jaws were loose and muscles in here and everything. So, so but the truth is, all it is is triggering this. And they found out these were the only ones that needed to be triggered. And like I've been telling everybody, not necessary to want to smile just to to activate the muscles and you will start wanting to smile more and be happier you people were happier on campus when they were checking the students and everything that's what was happening yeah so the intuition we use it if we're stuck in something in meditation we start to tap into it it's there in all of us it'll just give you the answer and you'll know but it doesn't happen like you don't command it you you give it an idea and it, the answer comes to you the problem for us is um in this day and time Oh, we just are not connected anymore with the powers of the universe and universal laws and the uh, powers of the, the directions and the power of the sun and the power of the moon. We're disconnected from this. Some different professions are uh, connected to it uh, in astronomy and astrology and all kinds of things like that. Okay. But the average population is disconnected from this. It's like they don't have time for it. They've been brainwashed to keep working for the man and keep working for the man and keep working for the man. And, and you know, down in the women's liberation movement, I say, isn't there a woman I can work for? Because <laughs> the expression in all the books was working for the man, working for the man, we're working for the man, even in the blues songs. And I'm working for the man, and I'm working for the man, yeah, I work. And I'd go sing, and I'd say, I'm working for the woman, and I'm working for the woman, just to be smart, you know, and, and tease these guys, you know, that it's not just a man. I had my own business. There were five, six people working for me, you know? <laughs> so when you ask the question, it will come to you what you need to do, and it's in the deeper levels of the meditation when you're in quiet mind when you get up into quiet mind okay are there any other questions okay one of the things that happened in i'll, I'll talk to you a little bit it, just somebody wave to me if you have a question if you're thinking about one um in the retreat uh mm, one thing was trying too hard and um uh and i had an interesting experience because um in one case a person would say it's it's good though i feel really good about it because i'm not here anymore and then they would write their report and and i would see all the places they were still there <laughs> and this was interesting to play with this and to try to get the person to see that they were still there and you know sometimes you can practice for years and then you have a deep experience and you think you're not there anymore you have to be careful of that um you get you get very confident you're not there and then all of a sudden when something big happens that is a big deal and you uh, and somebody does something way out of line 
that causes a big upset and you you actually get upset and you're so surprised that you get upset you're not sure what to do um, don't quit <laughs> you know but it can be a shock that oh my gosh I was still there you see and it, and you need to know that sometimes you can be very uh, advanced and get through several experiences with this and still something could happen where all of a sudden someone who you totally trusted or they said they would do something and they assured you they would not do anything out of line or something like that and then they did something and it was very dangerous to you thought it was that's another thing you thought it was very dangerous to the situation but you you reacted and you didn't even think you had it in there anymore and to say okay fine that was lasting for a long time <laughs> You know, five years is a long time and have something like that happen. And then you have to back up and say, well, do you really believe in a Nietzsche? Does a Nietzsche have a timeline on it and a timer on it? You know, <laughs> you know, and you kind of laugh with yourself and say, okay, nobody, I'm, you know, you're not immune to this, you see? And everybody should keep this in mind because sometimes we can't see where we are and unfortunately we're not in a situation where we can always go and um one person that i had come into the retreat was uh, someone who uh, had some really good experiences and went to several places oh don't worry about that that's nothing and then the analyzing wasn't there that then and then you want to say well i was so angry that person said well don't be angry at him how can they identify with something they've never experienced and they they don't understand that that is something someone could experience because if you're if you're practicing this way instead of this way you can't experience what we're talking about so how can i be angry at you for saying that's not possible because you know what in this way it is not possible that's a fact it is not possible to talk about it the way that we're talking about it so it's not that um, um, you have to back off to see if there is a possibility of something else. So the thing is, when we practice something, someone was talking to me about this, if you're practicing something making you more narrow in your mind, this is it, this is it. After all, there's about 5,000 people sitting around me, it must be it. <laughs> and, and that it has to be it, <laughs> okay? And the question remains, you know, if, if you're not experiencing an opening and a changing and a calming down in, uh, in, your, in your experience with life and things are not happier and you're not getting along better and you're not getting along with people, then maybe you need to see that you're, you're getting not tight in your mind about what it has to be. See? Um, so we have to be careful of this and we have to keep an open mind to possibilities and that's why it's so much fun to work with it the way we're working with it because we never say the door is locked we cannot change what we say this is and we over the years we've changed our definitions as we discovered that there's a shorter way or a clearer way or a simpler way to say it and we've been criticized for it and we don't care because you guys contribute to it. You know, the six R's didn't come from us. The six R's came from a student who walked in and sat down in front of us at a retreat and basically said, you know, what we're doing is this. We're recognizing and then we're releasing and relaxing and then we're re-smiling and we're returning. It's like a bunch of R's. And when he uh, said it to us, he said, um, recycle at the end. He didn't say re re turn uh, again or repeat he didn't say that he said reset but we kind of said repeat as needed like a medical a medical prescription repeat as needed yeah but it is it's a recycling process to change to ch change your mind and just be happier about everything that's what it is okay so um i don't have yeah yeah um, so formations, uh, is that the same as karma? Okay, 
let's do this. I'll do karma really quickly for you, the quick version. <laughs> so, you, so you know where I'm coming from. I come from an old version of this. Um, I'm going to erase this little guy. Sorry, Charlie. Here he goes. <laughs> it wasn't a bad one. It was pretty good, actually. All right. Good girl. Okay. <laughs> Pat myself on the back. All right. So let's go here and let's see whether you can see for just a minute that there's four words in, in, in explaining karma. Whoops. There, there are four words. And not everybody does it this way anymore. I'll, I'll show you what it is. Um, the first one is um, you're going to do something. So you say, okay, there is nakama. Okay. And you know, the Sanskrit, the Sanskrit, I'm having fun with this. <laughs> okay, there's a comma. The Pali is comma and the Sanskrit is karma. Okay. So this is the action that you take. Okay. Now, before you take this action, the way this works, there's chaitana, right? Chaitana. So the chaitana is the intention for this action. So this one here, this one means, no, go away, go away. Where'd you go? Go on. How did I do that? I don't know what you are. <laughs> I don't know what the square is, <laughs> right? Okay, um, let's go here again. Okay, the chaitanya is your intention, okay? Okay. Okay, this is your intention. And the karma, the karma is the action, okay? That you take. Now the action that forms um, the um, reaction has to be a, a physical or verbal. The mental doesn't produce, uh, isn't part of mental causes problems for you if you, you know, but if the mental part of it is not gonna produce a, um, how the, the, the fruit, not the same way. So chaitan is the intention, calm is the actual action. Now, this is the one that they sort of let, leave out. I'll show you what happened. And I don't know how it happened. I really don't, you know, because I grow plants and orchards and lived on a farm. And this fellow right here is called Vipaka. And Vipaka is important because Vipaka is the ripening, okay? This is the ripening of the action that you do, okay? Now, this is all very logical. We do it with an apple tree when we're finished. I'll show you, okay? So that's your ripening period. So you did an action, now it has to ripen, and then it's going to produce a, um, a fruit. And this is the fala. So... And this is, we, we used to say Kamapala, Kamapala, okay? We put this word, Kamapala, and this is the fruit of action, is what this is, okay? Now, now we talk about an apple tree, right? It's easy to understand karma if you look at an apple tree, okay? Um, the first thing you do is you have an intention to produce an apple tree, you grow an apple tree. So you plant a seed, okay? And it begins to grow and it grows like this. And then it comes up and then it goes out and it gets branches and all this stuff, right? And then it even gets apples. <laughs> this is the ripening period. It gets, it gets flowers first. They're little white flowers, little white flowers. I, these are not white, but little, little tiny white flowers, right? And then 
all these little flowers, they turn into apples. Okay, apples like this. And the apple, the apple, uh, when the apple is finished is the fruit, right? This is the fruit. Okay, now, over time, I don't know how they did this, but in the Abhidhamma books, most of the time, it says intention, action, vipaka. It doesn't say anything about fruit. It says vipaka means fruit. So I went to the old libraries at a couple universities, and vipaka, sure enough, vipaka was ripening. So I don't know exactly the dates it happened, but somebody changed it and decided to cancel out Kamapala. But when I went back in Sri Lanka and I went in to um, look for some old small pamphlets that were about karma, I, and I talked to Bhikkhu Bodhi too, he said, yeah, the older books, you know, they had four parts, Chaitana, Kama, Vipaka, and Kamapala. So you have an intention to do something and then you take action. The action can be verbal or physical, okay? And when you take that action, after it happens, the event has a period of ripening. Now, there's different kinds of, I, I don't know all the different kinds. Somebody told me there was 11 different kinds one time. I don't know, but it's, I know basically you can have uh, the ripening of uh, a comma, an action that took place in a past lifetime where the energy of the actions, the actions always produce um, there goes that little thing again. I don't know what it is, but you got to get rid of it. Okay, the action um, action produces uh, action produces. I want a good one here. Let's see this one. Okay, let's try that. The action always produces energy, right? Energy, and it is this energy that is is flowing from. Uh, lifetime to lifetime and moves from uh, in a person when they die it's the energy of the actions that moves the kama uh, kama pala the fruit so if the fruit can like say well an extreme example is Mogalana in another lifetime venerable Mogalana had killed a patricide matricide situation where he killed his mother and his father Okay, so then, you know, we don't know, I don't know much about his other past lives, I never read that part, but in the end he has a horrible death and he has a horrible death happen here, he, he is an arahat and he's uh, working with the Buddha, but he has a terrible death that happens and the reason is because it's the end of, even though he's an arahat, it's the end of the burning off of the energy from the action that happened in another lifetime, come and catching up with you. Another in interesting one was um, I grew up, and this is just a personal one, but I grew up not afraid of heights at all, okay? And, and in the forest, very young, building platforms up in trees, 20, 30 feet up off the ground, not afraid at all. And even in my uh, older years, uh, I had done it some with my kids different ways, working on roofs and fixing things and building things. But um, when I was in my, uh, in my um, late 40s, I was flying um, ultralight planes, 1,000, 3,000 feet off the ground, you know, down by the ocean and stuff. And I had no fear at all. Some people were really terrified of this. I had no fear at all of it or jumping out with a parachute on. The only thing about the parachute is I didn't enjoy it that much going down because I was watching this beautiful plane fly away and I was wondering why I had jumped out of a perfectly good plane. <laughs> and I'm floating down to the bottom and he says, do you want to do it again? I said, no, if I have to do it again, I'm going to stay in that beautiful plane. <laughs> I mean, he's, didn't you like the scene? I said, I never even looked at the scene. You know, <laughs> it was very funny. But when I did the hang gliding, you know, the the um, parasailing thing up on the Himalayas, oh, I loved it. It was fantastic. Anyway, I never had any fear. And then I come to 51, okay? And what happens, 51 years old, we're in Missouri, we're in an old house, and the roof is broken in the kitchen, 
and you need to clean out the leaves out of the gutter on the roof. And Bonte says, here's the ladder, go up and clean the leaves out of the gutter on the roof. And I climbed up the ladder okay, but when I got on the roof, my legs froze. And I was terrified and I turned gray, my heart, oh my goodness, I was panting and I was really afraid. And it's an interesting thing because I'd never been afraid and I didn't understand why I was afraid. And he said, come down, come down. You know, so I got on the ladder and he had to, you know, hold the ladder at the bottom so I could get down. I managed to get down. And he said, we got to look into this. <laughs> Basically, because he didn't want to get on the roof and dig the stuff out of the gutters. So we looked into it and he said, if you're good enough to do this, you know, because I had stability at that time. I had good stability in the, in the fourth jhana equanimity, really strong. You have to have really good stability to do this. He said, I'll teach you how to do past lives and you can see, you can do it with a, with a um, mastery of determination kind of thing, but you're doing it for a purpose. And now they've written books about this too. They've written books about this. So I have a phobia that I don't know why I have this fear. And I could not climb the, we went up before we started doing it, work on it. Um, I went up the fire tower and was almost in tears. I could only go up one level and it's five stories high. And I could not go up the fire tower. And the final test was to run up to the top and open my arms and say, I'm fixed. <laughs> You know, so what happened was we did the, we did the, uh, he would, we were in Florida and in, in a location where I could be alone and I could work on this and um, he was gone and back and forth and checking on me and uh, I went back five lifetimes basically is the story and, and the all five lifetimes there were women and I didn't want details, a lot of details, that's not why I was there and because I, I did it for the purpose of seeing um, why I was afraid of heights. And they kept taking me back to the day they were dying, the day they were dying. And so these women, one of them fell off of a house, one of them fell off of a wall, one of them fell off the mast of a ship, one of them fell off a cliff, and the other one fell into a crevice like a, a, a fissure that was in a pasture, and they died. All of them were 51 or 52 years old. And at the, after the fifth one, he said, do right, you need to do more? And I said, you know, this has nothing to do with me. Isn't this crazy? It has nothing to do with me. It's something from another place in another lifetime and it's nothing to do with me. And therefore, I, I don't know, I think I'm okay. And he said, well, let's see if you're okay. The leaves are still in the gutter, <laughs> you know, in the roof. And so first we went up to the fire tower after lunch and I went up to the top. I climbed all the way up and um, I just put my arms up and said, I'm fine. I'm not sweating. I'm not clammy. I'm not cold and I'm fine. My legs don't hurt. And then I came down again. And then of course, I cleaned the leaves out of the gutter on the roof. So how did this all work? The way it worked was this was an energy that had come forward from a comma, something that happened, an event in other lifetimes. I wasn't interested who these people were. They were not in the United States. They were mostly in places in Europe, okay? I knew I was in Europe, but I did, wasn't interested like what's the town, what's the family, all this. I was only interested in how old are you? And I knew how old they were when it happened and I saw what happened. And they just connection of not having anything to do with this lifetime was enough for the whole thing to stop. And everything stopped, fine. I can climb a ladder, I can stand on a chair now to change a light bulb or something. I don't have trouble uh, climbing over a wall if I have to. I'm a little slower <laughs> now because I'm older. But this is how this stuff works. So the intention of the action determines the pressure or the severity of the uh, the of the um, the fruit that will happen at the end. 
but there's a period of time between an action you take and the ripening of what you did before you get to the point of the fruit coming in. And sometimes you'll do something and uh, you don't say you're sorry for it and you're not, you didn't keep your precepts, you don't say you're sorry for it or forgive yourself and the other person. If you forgive yourself and the other person, it alleviates the fruit coming back. It makes it so it's not as harsh that when it comes back is what people tell me. And um, the ripening period is really important to be there because of how this whole process actually works. I have no idea why they took it away, but it's very simple. You have Chaitanya, you have Kama, the action that you take, you have the Vipaka, the ripening period, whether it have, comes back on you in this lifetime or another lifetime. And then the Fala, the Fala is the fruit of it, the Kama Pala is the fruit of that action. And um, in this lifetime, you know, if you did something, like say you were a teenager and you said terrible things to your mother once, and you really, you when you're meditating, the thing about meditation is that, I'm gonna go back here now, um, get off of here. Um, but now, see, the thing about this is that you didn't say you were sorry. You never said you were sorry. Like I had an incident recently with somebody who was a student who had something that happened where uh, the mother in, uh, interrupted the student who was doing yoga and he was doing a shashana at the end of his yoga, his cooling down period, a special way, a very special way. Now that he knew that, he knew from reading about it that one thing you should never ever ever do was to get really mad and angry if you were in the midst of doing this particular kind of practice okay you should not do that his mother didn't know that he was doing this is the sad part didn't know he was doing this 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 shashana uh, shasana i think it's called at the end of the practice he didn't tell her she started screaming at him, will you please get done the yoga? I need you to do work in the house. And what happened was he exploded back at her, exploded out of the yoga back at his mom. And uh, he, he ruined his, his, he hurt himself, actually hurt himself very badly. And after that, he could not concentrate for even five minutes on his yoga and hold a position. And all kinds of things happened. And he was supposed to have been in our retreat, but after two days, he was cured and he just went back to his yoga. <laughs> but uh, what he needed <laughs> was very interesting what, how I got him to, to get over this. But the one thing I told him, he had to promise me if he wasn't coming back for the retreat, he was going to buy flowers for his mother and apologize to her and tell her it was just as much his fault as anything because he didn't tell her what was going on. But he was, he was really debilitated and he could hardly talk and he couldn't sleep at all. He's, he had a whole bunch of locked in energy inside. And essentially what happened to him, he was torn away from his earthly grounding. He was grounded uh, as a human being, we are grounded to the earth. And even in this day and time, we are grounded to the earth because we're part of the earth's whole ecological system and he was ripped up from that and he couldn't he could not get reattached to it so first you know he had to go out and walk in the mud and dirt and get dirty and feel that the the earth again some and then he had to forgive himself for what he did and then he had to in order to sleep he had to stop uh, he stop thinking in order for him to stop think was to put himself in the meta in the meta protection in the bubble like it's like a shroud around you and then go to sleep and protect himself and he slept like a baby the first night and the next night he had a little trouble because somebody came up in the inside the dream and i told him to put that person in the bubble so there's two bubbles in there and just sleep and keep smiling 
And he said, nobody ever told me to smile before. And I said, well, it's about time you do. You're 26 years old, you need to smile. And he started smiling. And then, you know, everything started to uh, get better very, very quickly. And then he sat his first day, only 20, 30 minutes the next day, an hour. And then he, he started laughing. When I told him how to put things in perspective, I taught him past, future, present time. And then I told him how to let go of the past stuff and not worry about the future. So terrified. I'm totally debilitated. I can't speak. I can't work. I can't help my mom. I can't do yoga. I can't do anything. And came out of it in two days. And then just said, I'm back. But now I know I can smile and open up. And he's uh, really happy. So this whole thing about the uh, karma, uh, is, does everything happen equally and all that, is based on the ch chetana, okay, the intention. We have a silly story of two men working at a company and the one man, it's time to go home from work, and the one man is driving home for dinner and the other man is really angry at his boss before he left and got in the car and started going over how mad, like he said this and I said this and boy, he's wrong and I'm right and all this in his mind. And he's driving and he's very angry and he's driving home. And along the way, um, he kills a dog. The, the guy who was just driving home accidentally killed a dog. And then he goes home and he feels real bad about it. And he, um, decides to go back and get the dog and give it to the owner and that kind of thing, you know, cause he's so sad about it. And he does whatever he can to fix it in, for himself. And that's the end of it. But the other guy was so angry when he saw a dog on the side of the road, he swung over on purpose to hit the dog cause he was so angry because the dog was on the road. He shouldn't be there. And he killed the dog. Now the, the question is, they both killed a dog on the way home from work. What is the Kamapala? What do you think? You see? Because the one person was regretful and he was uh, taking his precepts again and he tried to um, find out who owned the dog. Uh, once we saw a dog hit in California when we were traveling, the guy went left and we stopped and took the collar into the nearest town and turned it in, told him what happened. And uh, the guy was a friend of the policeman and he said, you don't know how grateful this man is gonna to be to know at least what happened to the dog. And we took the dog off the road. But, but anyway, um, you can do simple things to cushion the whole thing. <laughs> you know, if something goes wrong, but you can also forgive yourself and forgive the other person and not hold these things inside of you. And one of the most important things that you heard in the, in the, um, was when the lesson in 140 in the Datu Bibanga Sutta, um, that Upasati was taught the lesson because the Buddha forgave him right then. And he said, we forgive you. And you say, well, why is that there? Because he didn't want to, him to carry it around. And he said, we should never hold things in. Don't, the Buddha says we never should hold things in. Because if we hold things in and we don't forgive ourselves and forgive others, these things fester right back here in the back of your head. You get a sore headache from right back here in the back of your head and sometimes it comes up around here and up to the top like that. That one is you are storing stuff. You are putting stuff in the little car and putting it in the trunk and holding on to it. Don't hold on to stuff. You don't have to. You really don't have to hold on to stuff, okay? And you forgive yourself, forgive the other person and let it go, yeah? So this is how this, uh, you, you have a remedy for this and uh, you don't be holding on to stuff, okay? Anybody else have a question? Is that okay? That's enough? Yeah, okay. Um, anybody else have a question? Hmm? Monty, you have any questions? Come in on the chat. I know there is no question, but it is already two hours, so should we end this? Okay. Yeah, oh, you, you have another one, Deepa? 
No? Okay. Uh, no, it has been already two hours, so should we okay. end? <laughs> we should. So, um, so what we will do um, uh, on Saturday, we'll choose a sutta uh, that has to do with the um, uh, the next one. I'm not sure what the next one is because we changed the, the index a little bit um, from this one to the next one. I'm not sure. But we can find one that has to do with the parts that we're talking about here. It's not hard. And and choose one. I'll try to choose one that you haven't heard before. Okay? Okay, then I'll announce uh, not a problem. Yeah, okay. But the big thing is to, to be able to be here. And if you have anybody that wants to, I'll be sure and tell the, um, the, the ones that were in retreat this last time, send it out to them so that Newton knows to tell the teachers because they always want to come in for when we're talking about the dependent origination. And this time what we're going to do, um, it'll be next Saturday. Um, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, okay? Then we'll do it. So we'll give it a week to get enough, as many people as we can to do this, okay? And then um, we will put an announcement up about what you ought to have when you do this. Because the most important part of this is when we, we do this workshop is that you draw your own chart. So I don't want you to take the color chart out that I give out. I want you to actually go step by step through the, the um, development of the chart for each one of the links, okay? And because if you see it and say it and write it, you'll really know it, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. May, May suffering, suffering ones be suffering free and the fear-struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's deep dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.